Chapter 18, the Victorians make the modern, 1880-1917. So we're still in this post-Civil War Industrial Revolution era. This chapter goes into the into World War One, which of course is a you know a, a major event that that changes the direction of everything. So we'll learn about that when we get there. So so what's a Victorian? What what do we mean by Victorian America? Well, it relates to the era of Queen Victoria in England, 1837-1901. So she is uh, you know, the reigning queen for for more than half of the night uh, the 19th century. Now, but you might ask, well, did, but didn't we fight a revolution to get away from them? What, why, why would they have influence on us? Well, you know, the, the people that fought the revolution, they still came from Europe. They still have roots there. And they looked at Britain, even though they just defeated them, as kind of like their big sister. And they, and they took advice and they, and they followed the trends that, that, that Britain did, okay? Uh, so the era of Victoria is considered to be a time of change. When the British Empire reached its height, industry and trade expanded rapidly. <clears throat> Science and technology made great advances. The middle class grew enormously, with an overall population growth of 50%. And it changed from an agricultural nation to a mainly industrial one. So just like what happens in the United States, they're just a little bit ahead of, ahead of them. Uh, in, and and like and like the United States, in spite of Britain's prosperity during the Victorian era, workers lived in terrible poverty. Some noted authors of the of the era English literature: Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes books, the Bronte sisters, well-known poets and novelists. Charles Dickens wrote a number of of novels, very famous: Oliver Twist, <clears throat> A Christmas Carol, A Tale of Two Cities, David Copperfield. And Charles Darwin with the very controversial on the origin of species and brings, of course, this idea, the theory of, of evolution that we've talked about a little. Uh, very controversial, starting the science versus faith, faith argument that still rages today. These, these authors define the Victorian era uh, for Britain in this, in this time. And you have the, the, the idea of the stuffy English. This was a period of refinement in England of peace and prosperity and the people specifically the men were considered to be moralistic and not profane uh, they promoted political and industrial reform uh, they were about self-restraint and moral uplift <clears throat> and you have the beginning of what what americans especially call the stuffy and proper english okay uh, so as the middle as the American middle class emerges, you know it's 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 following the, the the lead of Britain that they're they're doing the same thing they're they're evolving the same way. <clears throat> so again, England still influenced the behavior of the world in this era at the height of their power, including America. But they have the same issues in both countries: the working class versus an emerging middle class. The working class continued to live in squalor and poverty. The middle class, we remember the middle managers, those people that were able to move up a level and come up into the middle class and, and had success, had disposable income. They began to enjoy life. Uh, the wives of these men could now afford to have housekeepers and perhaps cooks, so they didn't have to be home slaving away in the home so much. It gave them free time, and they went out to in the world to pursue refinement. And department stores are... are uh, uh, built for the first time. So, of course, today we have malls full of department stores, but back in this day, you had a department store was a big deal. And they called it department stores because it had all different kinds of departments, clothing, furniture, whatever it might be. Um, and and these, these go on through most of my young childhood. You know, malls didn't really start coming around in the 70s and 80s like we have today. So department stores were called Adamless Edens, a place for a woman to go uh, where, there were, where there weren't any men. It wasn't male dominated and they were catered to. They had nurseries, tea rooms, clerks to guide and help you. You know, Everything had always been oriented towards males before, but now business, commerce, advertising began to look at women, especially middle class white women. Again, why? Because their husbands made more money and it created leisure time for the ladies where they could pursue refinement and spend money, okay? So lots of places started gearing towards women. 
and you had you know ladies nights and ladies specials and and railroads with ladies cars trying to trying to make try, trying to create comfort for these prosperous women okay what about men well the, the YMCA comes out of this era the, the young men's young men's christian association 1851 it was a men's only club that gave them access to athletic fitness that started to become popular it wasn't that it hadn't been popular before, but you just worked too hard to think about let's work out now. You were too tired. You went to bed. You've been working out all day. But now you might be working in an office and you're, you're sedentary. So you start to think about fitness and health. The YWCA for women started four years later in 1855. It was actually around for a long time, but never quite as popular as the YMCA. And when I was young, the, the YWCA was still around. But today... The YMCA, YMCA is, is a co-ed organization that includes both men and women. But in those days, just men. So games like basketball, sports, sports like basketball and volleyball were invented as indoor sports for the winter for, so men can continue playing even when it's you know frozen outside. Uh, the wealthier men went to country clubs and got into tennis and golf and swimming for the more daring boxing, weightlifting, martial arts. Uh, baseball became the what became known as the national pastime. Uh, became became very very popular, uh, and and the idea of sports and following a team starts in this era. Again, prior to this, you were just too busy. You just, you worked too hard to worry about these types of of what in those days would have been called a trivial pursuit. Uh, so baseball became very popular, uh, but the big leagues were just for white players. If you were black, you had to play in your own league called the Negro Leagues. And very famous Hall of Fame players like Satchel Paige and Jackie Robinson played in these Negro Leagues. Now, Robinson would break the color line in the 1940s by being the first African-American to make the big leagues with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, football was very popular, but at the college level, in the 19th century, there wasn't any pro football, uh, but but still not even close to baseball. Baseball was the national obsession. And of course, today, probably the NFL is, but for many years, even, even when I was very young, baseball was the was the game that everybody wanted to, to be part of. And you have organizations that start to that think about preservation and conservation. We talked about Yellowstone. National Park Service starts in 1916, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, uh, the National Wildlife Refuge System, 1903. Uh, what, what is their purpose? To, to preserve objects of historic and scientific interest, because we know the land had been, had been getting torn up considerably with all the business pursuits of the, of the Americans coming west. So these are an attempt to preserve parts of it that were of interest. The National Audubon Society to protect wildlife centered on conservation. So all, all these things come, come to be because if we, if we go back to this picture here, you now have automobiles. They're cheaper. You have people with free time. You have better roads. And people start to go out in the world and, and explore it, okay? Um, of course, if you're a member of the working class, you didn't take part in this very much. Uh, you, were, you were working 60 hours a week and living in, living in poverty and squalor. Um, of course, the Jim Crow South con uh, it continues. Uh, you know, African Americans in the South continued to be uh, discriminated against illegally. Illegal Jim Crow laws, black codes, kept uh, whites and blacks segregated. Okay. And you have the start of, of this era that went on uh, again well into my lifetime before this before this came to an end. Uh, different restrooms, different drinking fountains. You couldn't go into restaurants, uh, and so on. Uh, this went on for a very very long time. So segregation uh, technically is illegal if you want to look at the Constitution. Again, the Fourteenth Amendment, integra integrated America. It didn't matter what color you were. Everybody has the same rights as everybody else. But in the South, because of illegal state black codes, they kept blacks from their, from their uh, opportunities. So I, I, I've said it many times before. I'll say it many times again. Very shameful. Uh, 
So a very famous uh, landmark case regarding civil rights, and, and one that is very important to understand and know, because uh, the civil rights movement didn't really start in the 50s and 60s like we all think. It goes back much further. And this is, uh, this is 1896, so Plessy versus Ferguson. So this cartoon is, is actually being derogatory when it says separate but not equal, because this, the Supreme Court decision was separate but equal. So I'll, I'll get to that in a minute here, but just kind of an idea of what we're talking about in, in, in exaggeration. But the white drinking fountain's got a little chair pouring water into it, and and you, you got a little little guy tooting a little horn, and you know it's 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 very um, you know nice. The black drinking fountain is a pump of a bucket uh, with weeds on the ground. Okay, so what is this case? Uh, an 1896 Supreme Court case that ruled that racially segregated railroad cars and other public facilities if they claimed to be separate but equal, were permissible according to the 14th Amendment. If they claim to be, apparently they don't have to prove it, you just have to claim it. So the Supreme Court makes this decision. It, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult to understand how they did. The 14th Amendment gave everybody the rights of citizenship, equal access to the law, no one's above anybody else. Yet in the South, for a hundred years, blacks were oppressed and discriminated and kept down and segregated. So how did they do that? How did the Supreme Court do that? Are they not looking at the Constitution? It would it would seem so. Okay. Uh, so this this was a planned event. Uh, a, a man named Homer Plessy, and that's where the Plessy comes from. Homer Plessy was a mixed race man. And he was part of the, you know, kind of emerging black civil rights or, or organization, black organizations to, to push for their rights, especially in the Jim Crow South. And he and his organization decided to, to do this. And, and this was a planned event. So Homer went into the whites only car where he was not allowed. And he sat down. This is a, this is a first class car on a, on a Louisiana railroad. So of course he was told to move to the what was called the colored car in those days, mm -hmm. but he refused and was arrested. So he knew he'd be arrested. So why would he do that? Why why would he go and just get arrested? Because once he's arrested, it's now in the legal system and you can take it to court. You can't just take something to court because you want to. An event has to kind of happen to bring it to court. So that's what he did. <clears throat> but that's what he and his organization did. They want to set a precedent for future cases. So what's a precedent? A very important legal term. A judge must follow any decision by a higher court in a case with similar material facts. Courts should also follow their own previous decisions. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've all seen a TV show where the attorney is arguing the case to the judge, and he says, according to Johnson versus Mississippi in 1967, and he goes on to state his case, that's what we're talking about here. When a decision is made in the past, in a past case, it, it, it sets a precedent for cases that come after it. And you, you have to follow that decision until something overturns it, okay? So it means the court should not change the law unless they absolutely have to. Certainty is more important than injustice, <clears throat> okay? Uh, so a precedent. An earlier event or action that is regarded as an example or guide to be considered in subsequent similar circumstances. So why is this important? Uh, because a, a ruling established in a previous case, legal case, is binding or persuasive for another court when deciding subsequent cases with similar issues or facts. So you, you want to set precedent. When a, when, a, when a precedent establishes an important legal principle, in some cases, it becomes known as a landmark decision, okay? So landmark decisions today, anything about abortion, Roe v. Wade, birth control, re reproductive rights, uh, the, the right to same-sex marriage, these, these are all, you know, very controversial landmark decisions today, okay? So in, in the case of Plessy, discrimination and segregation had not been tested by the courts yet. Why not? Because they'd been slaves before that. They had no access to the courts. Okay, 
but they had no access to the law. <clears throat> so, so this was a, a planned event, not random. He wanted to get arrested to, to, to get it into the court to set, try to set a precedent. A, another example, just to jump forward here another 60 years, but to kind of you know give you a, a couple examples of, of other people that did the same thing, Rosa Parks, very famous for sparking the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott of 1955. She sat in the front of a bus, and the you know the law said that she had to give up her seat if a white person wanted it. Well, she did. She refused. She got arrested. That was also planned by her organization that was that was uh, uh, led by Martin Luther King. So Martin Luther King makes his his kind of a, you know, emergence as a as a leader in, in this event. Uh, another uh, example that maybe did Kira, but similar. John T. Scopes, what became known as the Scopes Monkey Trial. It was against the law to teach evolution in the South. Uh, and John T. Scopes it was a teacher, didn't like that. He felt that he should teach his, his students both sides. So he and, and his organization decided, I'm going to go ahead and teach it, get arrested, and we'll bring it to court. And that's what happened. And then we'll talk about both of these both of these trials later on in this class and just bringing them going forward a little bit to show you more examples of people that did this. Um, so Plessy is the precursor to Rosa Parks. Both were planned events to bring discrimination into the courts by forcing the courts to make a precedent. So, so following cases would have a precedent to refer to. And of course, they had all the confidence in the world that the 14th Amendment would stand up and that they would be successful. But it kind of backfired. The Supreme Court ruled that you could be separate as long as you're equal. So again, someone showed me an example when it was separate and equal. Here you see on the left, the upper image there, you see two high schools. One on the left is nice rows of folding you know, chairs that are bolted to the ground. You've got a balcony, a nice stage. On the right is the, is the black auditorium with folding chairs, you know, haphazard, no balcony. Um, is that is that equal? No, um, I, I wouldn't think so. And of course, you you see this throughout the entire South in in the in the Jim Crow era. It was, ne it was never equal. It was always separate, but never equal. So the the, the Supreme Court put its head in sand uh, by by cons by considering that conditions for blacks and whites were equal. I mean, everyone knew that it wasn't. Everyone knew that it wasn't. Uh, blacks did not have access to land, education, opportunity. Uh, schools were understaffed. They they had they had old books, uh, dilapidated old school buildings. Uh, did the Supreme Court come to Louisiana to confirm the equality? No, they assumed it was equal, but everyone knew it wasn't. It was a racist decision. It was another way to keep. The freed people down. Don't let them gain a foothold. Don't don't let them have their rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Uh, so this is an unjust result, and I mentioned before the Supreme Court very racist in that era. But looking for a positive, the, the precedent was set, even though it didn't go go for them. It was still set to now bring other cases to court, and perhaps somebody will overturn that, and, and we will see that happening uh, later on in this class. Uh, okay, let's change directions here a little bit and talk about women. Let's do a supplemental lecture here, number four. Uh, were women safe in the workplace? Uh, and here's our outline. Number one, introduction, we're talking about 19th century women and that they start to enter the workforce and, and give me details about what that means. Number two is Freud, Sigmund Freud. So I'm, so I'm, I'm bringing an, uh, a theory of Sigmund Freud into this lecture to try to to try to state my argument or 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 make my argument okay uh, so so don't get confused Freud's not here to work for women he's got nothing to do with that I'm just using his theory that he had about men to explain why this was a problem okay number three is violence so I want you to give me examples of violence against women and then I want you to give me examples of of our culture today and how it is it, it is a a, a culture that's the, that you can say is anti-women. Number four, what's the crime of opportunity? Uh, number five, of course, like always, is relevance, okay?
Okay, let's get started. So many thought women in the 19th century did not need equal rights because they were protected by their husbands or fathers. And it was, it was you know, when women of this era were considered to be pampered. They were expected to stay home and raise children and create a haven of solitude for and reflection for their husbands. So for many years, many decades, it was expected that women stay out of the workplace. That was a haven for men. And, you know, the, the pure and moralistic women should never be in that environment to see men at their works being profane and greedy and competitive. So that was not a place for women. Uh, women should stay in the home where they would be safe, safe from men. But by the late 19th century, this all began to change as women started to emerge with pushing for, for you know, equal rights. Uh, we've talked about Elizabeth Cady Stanton before. And this is out of your book, The Talk of Sheltering Women, From the Fiercest Storms of Life is the Sheerest Mockery. The women began to speak out. We're, we're not so frail and weak. We're not incapable. So as the 19th century progressed, some women began to enter the workplace. But many felt that was a dangerous choice for women. And the question was asked, were women safe from men? Okay, so now I'm going to go to Freud and bring in his argument to try to make my point. Okay, so Sigmund Freud, very famous German psychoanalyst, he wrote a book called Civilization and Its Discontents. And in the book, he claimed that men had to learn to be civilized. It was not innate, not internal. Men need, need, need excuse me, men need to learn to follow the laws, follow the rules. They had to learn to stay inside society's boundaries. They had to learn the ideals of domesticity and learning to, how to respect women and the social purity that was associated with women of that time. Uh, accor according to Freud, civilization is largely responsible for our misery and that we should be much happier if we gave it up and returned to primitive conditions. Uh, Freud felt that being civilized was not a man's natural state and that it held him back from his base instincts. So, so according to Freud, civilization and its adornments needed to be learned, and the concept of it put a man in a state of anxiety because he was not able to respond to his natural urges. Uh, Freud claimed that there were tensions between civilization and the individual, and friction resulted from a man's quest for instinctive freedom on the one hand, versus civilization's demand for conformity and following the law on the other. This resulted in the repression of man's natural instincts. According to Freud, many of humankind's primitive instincts, for example, the desire to kill and the insatiable craving for sexual gratification, are clearly harmful to the well-being of a human community. As a result, civilization creates laws that prohibit killing, rape, and adultery and it implements severe punishments if these laws, I'm sorry, rules are broken. Thus, our possibilities for happiness are restricted by the law. This process, argues Freud, is an inherent quality of civilization that gives rise to perpetual feelings of discontent <clears throat> among its citizens. <clears throat> but let me understand what he's saying here. He, he is not condoning throw away the laws and like let men run wild. That's not what he's saying. He's simply saying that the natural urges of a man are being held back by civilization, and that creates issues, and that's why there's tension, and, and that's why there's violence, and, and that's why there's you know people lashing out. Okay, uh, so Freud's theory is based on the notion that men have certain characteristic instincts that are innate, internal, and that civilization cannot change that. So what are these characteristics? The desire for sex, violent aggression towards authority figures, sexual competitors, uh, I'm sorry, uh, aggression towards sexual competitors, all these people any, or anybody who obstructs an individual's path to gratification. So, so what are the seeds of male violence? While not all men are violent, men in general tend to be more violent than women. Uh, it, it's assumed that the male hormone testosterone is a kickstarter for aggressive behavior in men. And this affects male attitudes and the tendency toward violence. But the experts stress that as humans, 
including men, we make individual choices whether to be aggressive or not because we've learned by society to, to hold ourselves back. Uh, so is violence against women rooted in the way men and women are brought up in, in, in our society today, how they're socialized? The truth is violence against women has been accepted and even condoned throughout history. Uh, and here's some examples. Uh, more than 2,000 years ago, we're talking about law here for a minute. More than 2,000 years ago, Roman law gave a man life and death authority over his wife. If you didn't like your wife, you could simply get rid of her, kill her. That was completely okay and understandable in, in Rome. In the 18th century, English common law gave a man permission to discipline his wife and or children with a stick or whip as long as it was no wider than his thumb. That's where the name, the saying, the rule of thumb comes from. Uh, this prevailed in England and America uh, until the late 19th century, the era that we're talking about. You could, you could legally whip your wife or children with a stick or a whip as long as it was not thicker than your thumb. Uh, so many feminists today claim that violence against women uh, is the result of a deeply entrenched patriarchal culture, a male-dominated society that encourages and rewards male domination. Uh, they say that in a patriarchal culture, men are more likely to use violence to keep their dominant position, uh, while society claims to be against violence. We, on the other hand, make, make heroes of men who are aggressive. And these are the type of men that we look to, action type heroes. In this culture of masculinity, heroes are often associated with some type of violent action. Uh, this has become the traditional model of masculinity and one that encourages men to exude an aura of daring and aggression that includes <clears throat> sexual conquest. A, a woman doing the same thing is looked down on tremendously. There's a double standard here. Men are praised. Men are women are looked down upon. So how is violence against women portrayed in popular culture? Here are some examples from film, television, music videos, song lyrics, t-shirts, advertisements. Violence against women is often portrayed as normal or even erotic. Uh, critics claim these attitudes can set the stage for actual violence against women. I mean, I mentioned the rule of thumb. It's okay to beat your wife with a rod or a stick as long as it's not water in your thumb. I mean, really? Uh, I mean, what, what else do you need to know? But e even today, I would say more so today, we, we live in a somewhat of a rape culture in the United States. Sexual assaults, rape, attempted rapes, physical assaults against women. These continue to be uh, prevalent. Uh, and we've developed a rape culture. Sexual violence against women is common. Uh, prevalent attitudes, norms, practices, and media often condone, normalize, excuse, and even encourage sexualized violence. <clears throat> uh, Hollywood and Hollywood movies. So Hollywood is an industry considered to be a liberal industry. How many times do we see actors speaking out about civil rights and social justice or or you know, animal rights or whatever it might be, they're typically a liberal industry. Yet they continue to pump out movies that present women as sex objects. Uh, many movies have themes of abduction, bondage, rape, stalking, uh, and it's almost hard not to watch primetime TV and see one of those themes, <clears throat> okay? Uh, so violence and danger towards women continue to be popular themes. So are women and men really that different? <clears throat> so Freud and many others thought so. It, it was felt that women were not aggressive like men. They were more maternal, not as reactionary as men. So is Freud saying that women collectively had a better hold on their emotions than men? So if that's the case, how did men become the dominant uh, gender in our society today? Well, it was because they were stronger physically. So in a world of no laws, way back in the beginning, men dominated because of their strength. And it continues on today. So moving back into the 19th century, what were men doing? 
conquering, being aggressive, fighting wars, responding to threats with violence. So history is about conflicts and wars. And isn't it typically men who start wars and, and, and men who fight them? Uh, on the other hand, what were women doing? Collectively, they began to consider reforms, uh, pushing you know, against drunkenness, uh, uh, against domestic abuse, child abuse, poverty, working conditions, you know, moving toward an era of reform <clears throat> that was solely inspired by women, the progressive movement. So as women began to enter the workplace, knowing all of this, were they safe for men in that environment uh, with no husband or father to protect them? So remember I said we make individual choices whether to be aggressive or not. <clears throat> so what is a crime of opportunity? <clears throat> this is interesting. This is a crime of opportunity is something that's done by a typically law-abiding citizen, a, a perfectly normal person that's never been arrested, never done a crime, but suddenly an opportunity presents itself that perhaps they can't pass up. So I'm going to give you an example. Okay, let's just say one day you decide that you want to go to the park, this big park that's near your house. So you get you get on the freeway, going down the freeway, you get off the off ramp, and and the off ramp goes right into the park's parking lot. You park right there. You go up a short flight of steps, and here's the big park. It's a huge, grassy park. Okay, you look around, and you don't. There's nobody there but you. But then you look to your right, and you see that there is one man sitting on a bench. All by himself, he's got a bag uh, on the ground next to his feet. So you walk over to the bench and sit on the, on the opposite side. You don't say anything to him, but you just kind of notice that this man's this bag he has on the ground is overflowing with cash, and I don't mean you know dollars. I mean hundred dollar bills and packets stuffed stuffed out of this bag, overflowing, and your eyes are wide. Okay, but the man's just sitting there. But then. Way across the park, 200 yards away, another man steps into the vision and he's waving at the guy. And and the guy on the bench sitting next to you, he gets up, waves back, and and walks all the way out to the guy 200 yards away. That's a long way. That's two football fields away. But he left his bag of cash on the ground, just sitting there. There's nobody else there. So the guy is 200 yards away. You are... 20 steps from grabbing that bag, going down that short staircase, jumping in your car, and getting right in the freeway, and then you just disappear. You're gone, right? That's a crime of opportunity. You have this opportunity to, to benefit yourself, but you'll be breaking the law. You'll be stealing. But you, you, you look at it and think, well, I'll never get caught, so I'll do it, or, or not. So you have to make this decision, okay? So this was the fear. Uh, Men who were fathers and husbands were concerned for the safety of their wives and daughters. If they found themselves in a position where they would be alone with a male coworker in a situation where nobody else was around, would that woman be safe? Okay. Uh, okay, let me just find my spot here. So this is a, a unique development, but doesn't this just, in your mind, as, as you've been listening to this, especially if you're a woman, is this making you angry? Doesn't this just reinforce the idea that women are just helpless, that they can't take care of themselves, defend themselves, get themselves out of trouble? I mean, I, I guarantee most of the women that are listening to this have probably had to deal with an aggressive man before, you know, and uh, you have the ability to do it, okay? Uh, so the relevance of the, of the lecture is... <clears throat> Uh, some historians today believe this fear for their safety was just another ploy by men to keep women under their thumbs and keep them in their domestic roles. <clears throat> Excuse me. One more time. Some historians today <clears throat> believe this fear for their safety was just another ploy by men to keep women under their thumbs and keep them in their domestic roles. Okay, that is the end of supplemental lecture number four. Where women safe in the workplace. Okay, <clears throat> so moving on, let's talk about about uh, black uh, organizations and and pushing for equality <clears throat> and so on. So Booker T. Washington, a pretty famous guy, uh, born a slave, 
and wrote a famous book that you may have read in elementary school or junior high school, Up in Slavery. Uh, very popular black leader, instrumental in, in getting the black college uh, Tuskegee Institute off the ground. Became the leading voice for, for African Americans uh, early on in this movement. Okay, post post Reconstruction, I, he he became the the first you know kind of face of the movement. Uh, but then he started going in a direction that people that black people weren't expecting. Uh, Booker starts to, to to say that he felt blacks did not need book learning that they needed agricultural training, and he promoted industrial training. And the, and the black community says, no, no, wait a minute, we don't need any agricultural training. We've been doing agriculture for a couple of centuries. We need college to, to get ahead and move up. <clears throat> uh, in a speech in Atlanta, so Booker was invited to, to speak in Atlanta. I mean, that in and of itself is a pretty amazing thing because this is the Jim Crow South. You're not going to ask a black speaker to come and speak it, but yet they asked him to. Why would they do that? Well, here, here's an example. This is part of the of the Atlanta Compromise speech. Cast down your bucket among these people who have, without strikes and labor wars, tilled your fields, cleared your forests, builded your railroads and cities, <clears throat> brought forth treasures from the bowels of the earth, and helped make possible this magnificent representation of the progress of the South. So the black community comes unglued when they hear this like what are you talking about uh without strikes and labor wars we, we couldn't do that they would have killed us we didn't have the chance to brought forth treasures from the bowels of the earth to create this magnificent representation of the progress of the south the jim crow south what, what's progress about that they're keeping our constitutional rights from us how can you call this progress so this is why he was invited to speak because the the white community loved him, a black man that, that thought like them. Okay, uh, so he he seems to be approving of racial uh, segregation. Uh, here's another uh, a quote from him: "Slaves had proved their loyalty to whites. Again, and any ex-slave, I, I I was never loyal in my life, and I my my purpose in life is not to be loyal to them. Today we will lay down our lives if need be in defense of yours. No, I'm not going to lay down my life for any white person. Why would I do that? They enslaved me and my family for hundreds of years. Booker also believed the races should be socially detached, segregated. So people don't like this. Uh, he believed the races. We're like the like a hand. In all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one is the hand. In all things essential to mutual progress. So we're all we're all in the same. We all want the same thing, that the, the hand, but we'll, we'll but we'll act like fingers, be separate. Okay. He's condoning uh, segregation. Uh, he seemed to agree with and promote separateness. Uh, and like I said, whites agreed wholeheartedly and loved him. Uh, Booker felt a full assault on white supremacy would fail, and he supported building up the economic and social structures inside of segregated communities. But the younger, newer generation of blacks turned against him. So, in defense of Booker, I'm just I mean, this is my opinion, but I've done some research regarding him in my in my past, and this is an interesting, man. I think like a lot of people. Sometimes people say the wrong thing, they don't realize it. And if you're a public figure and you make comments like this, you can't really undo it. So I think he he phrased it incorrectly from what he meant. What he was trying to say was the black people, understand these white people aren't going to help us. They want you to fail. They're going to crush you at every every chance they have. So let's go slow at this thing. Don't worry about college and, and, and you know, different types of training. We're, we're good at agriculture. Let's focus on that because we can do that well. We can do it right now. Let's create an economic base by working hard, and we'll build a foundation. And in the next couple of decades or two, you know, our, our children or grandchildren, maybe by, by, they, by the time they come of age, they'll benefit from our work. I, that's what I think he meant, okay? Uh, this was a... a 
you know, a, a passionate leader of civil rights. So I don't think he meant to come off quite like he did, but he did and it, and it damaged him. And a man named W.E.B. Du Bois somewhat comes into the void as the, as the next black leader. So Du Bois was a former supporter of, of Booker, but he felt Washington's stance was conciliatory towards whites. One hesitates to criticize a life which beginning with so little has done so much. So don't forget Booker started as a slave. And yet the time has come when one may speak in all sincerity and utter courtesy of the mistakes and shortcomings of Mr. Washington's career, as well as of his triumphs, without being captious or envious and without forgetting that it is easier to do ill than well in the world. So the black community started to call Booker an Uncle Tom. So, so what's an Uncle Tom? Well, this is the main character in Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852, a very important book of bringing the ravages of slavery to the North so the Northern people realized it was a lot worse down there than, than they thought. Um, so the, the name Uncle Tom, even today, is became synonymous with the person that is subservient to whites, a black person that is subservient to whites. And a black person would call that person a Uncle Tom and Uncle Tom. Uh, so an Uncle Tom is is kind of a step in fetch. This, this is the old the old slave days where the master would say, you know, step and fetch it, get me this. And the and the slave would say, Yes, Massa. And uh, Uncle Tom became synonymous with a black man who knew his place in the white community subservient, docile, don't speak up. Of course, the newer generation of blacks as the 20th century is starting, they're not going to be like that. They want to be more radical, more militant. We want to push for our rights in this country that says we have them, but we're not getting them. Okay. Uh, it's interesting, in the 1930s, a man named Lincoln Monroe, an actor, his, his actual name that he used as an actor would step and fetch it. And here you see him looking kind of silly and he, he became a millionaire, made, made more than a million dollars uh, as a black man because he portrayed and, and you know, pushed these racial caricatures of, of, of black people. So it goes back to blackface minstrelsy as being silly, superstitious, scared of the dark, uh, childlike, uh, fearful, ignorant. And if they're not given a task, they're going to go sleep somewhere or eat some watermelon, right? Spit the seeds out. That, that, that's that's the, the awful stereotypes that were that came out of the Jim Crow South, but men like this continued to promote them. Um, so these became harmful stereotypes for African Americans. Uh, this this you know this continuation of the idea that they're stupid and ignorant. Uh, that was the description that the old slaveholders held to justify enslaving them. And, but we fought that war and we're free now. Uh, so this was harmful to these still newly freed people. Okay. Uh, moving towards white women, and we've talked about you know, their kind of steady climb towards pushing towards getting a vote. And you have the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU. Uh, so what is this? Uh, led by Francis Willard, one of your key people in your in your chapter, 1874, the WCTU is pushing for prohibition of alcohol. So temperance means that you don't drink. Stop drinking. That that's temperance. But they also push for women's rights in general, the vote, fighting poverty, uh, fighting the inequality of wealth. But but their but their main theme uh, purpose was temperance. But even when, when they determine that a man's a drunk, they still want to cater to him. And they say, help me to keep him pure. <clears throat> like he can't do it on his own. So help, let, let, let me help him. Okay. So they're still trying to help them, even though they're, these men in many cases were beating them because they drank so much. Uh, some women were responsible for the idea that became known as the lost cause of the Confederacy. This is a very important uh, idea that that resonates today. All the Confederate statues coming down, all the Confederate flags, the whole reason why they were there in the first place comes from the lost cause. You don't go to Germany and see Nazi flags and statues of, of Hitler everywhere, but you do in the South. This comes from this idea of the lost cause. 
So when the when the Confederacy was defeated, they they became very quickly worried about their place in history. Oh my gosh, we're going to be the vanquished people that were beaten because they wanted to, you know, continue enslaving people. That that's not a very nice nice description. So they start to spin this this these different ideas of what why this war was fought, <clears throat> and they began a campaign to bemoan the loss of the old South, the loss of this genteel, honorable society where slaves were protected and had a place in society, and that the Civil War wasn't about slavery at all. It was about bullies from the North coming down and beating us up and, and, and destroying our, our lifestyle. Uh, so organizations such as the Daughters of the Revolution, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, promoted the idea of the lost cause, <clears throat> where they romanticized the American South and lamented the loss of this chivalrous society. And of course, the famous movie Gone with the Wind, a huge example of the lost cause. <clears throat> the, the movie defended the Confederacy, the, the condemned Reconstruction. It supported the disenfranchisement and segregation of black people. So disenfranchisement means to deprive someone of the right to vote. Okay. I'm just giving you examples of women with agency, not always positive, but but still with agency and getting out there and 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 becoming you know relevant in society, no longer just housewives. Uh, that many women became involved in civil rights, including including black women. Uh, the National Association of Colored Women, uh, and they they push for orphan care, uh, elderly care, temperance. So again, uh, abstaining from alcohol. <clears throat> Ida B. Wells, one of the more famous radical black female voices, and brought the subject of lynchings to public notice. So, so what's a lynching? A lynching is when a mob kills someone, especially by hanging, for an alleged, alleged offense, so alleged offense, usually without a legal trial. So it's vigilante justice. You accuse somebody of doing something, and 20 men grab him and string him up. Okay, so lynching. So why, why was Ida so concerned about lynching? But she had firsthand experience with it in the town that she lived in. Uh, there's the black side of town, the white side of town, but the only grocery market in town was in the white side. So the blacks had to go into the white communities to go to the market. And of course, they were, you know, um, oppressed and discriminated against and, and treated rudely. And they couldn't they couldn't walk here and step off the sidewalk. And it's, you know, they always in fear of their lives. So a couple of Ida's friends, two men, decided to open a grocery store in the black community, and they were successful, and they opened the store. And when the owners of the white grocery store found out about this, they realized, we're, we're going to lose that business. Like, you know, it, you can't live with us. You can't be in our community. But it's, it's okay to come to my store and spend money, but don't look at my wife. Don't look at my kids. Don't just go home, but, but your money spends good here, okay? They realized that they're going to lose that lose that business. So they went to the black store and lynched the two men right there and hung them and killed them right in front of Ida. But she became very passionate about, about lynching. So, I mean, it's interesting, you know, uh, a very kind of American ideal, I hate to say. Lynching's murder. Understand, it's murder. It's against the law. Against the law in every state. But in the South... In the Jim Crow South, lynching became almost like a sport. Okay, um, between 1882 and 1968, that is 86 years. So 1882 is 17 years after the Civil War ended. Uh, they didn't start uh, keeping statistics until then. So understand this number I'm going to give you is probably much smaller than the, than the real number because of the number of, of of Africans that were lynched in the gym in the uh, Reconstruction era had to be an incredible number, but they didn't keep track of it. Okay, uh, so starting 1882 till 1968, 86 years, 4,743 people were lynched that were were reported lynched. Okay, so reported. So how many more were not reported? Uh, who knows? There's no way to know. Uh, 3,446 of these were black, 1,297 were white. So white, why would they lynch white people? Any guesses? Well, if you were 
aiding the black person, if you agreed with him, if you tried to stop them from lynching the black person, they'd lynch you too, okay? So these are incredible numbers, but to put it into perspective and try to grasp this, that's an average of 56 every year for 86 years. So more than one every week. On average, in the South, an average of more than one per week for 86 years. Think about that. Every week, four weeks in a, in a month, 12 months in a year, 86 times. That's how many people were lynched. That's an incredible, that, that's murder, okay? And um, you, you look at the images here. These people, and they're used on the left, you see the man hanging there, kind of coming out of the top of the screen. You see the two men tied to the posts here and, you know, stripped down and beaten and, and, and dismembered and, and uh, castrated in some cases. Yeah, you know, they, 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 they wanted to commit atrocities on these men. They hated them. But yet they all smile for the camera. The one on the left, you got a Memphis young son and, and his other son is smiling. And you see the you see the guy in the back over here. He's he's up on his toes to get his face in the camera. Why would you want to get your face in the in a picture of of the shows that you murdered somebody? And why would these people not be shying away from the camera? Well, go go back to the wounded knee, um, the the uh, chapter sixteen. Remember the where they came in and massacred the women and children. They and they and they built they dug a mass grave. For them. Remember I showed you the picture of the of the army all standing there smiling at the camera. I, I don't know what it is, but. These people were proud of what they're doing here, uh, so much so that, the, that you actually bring your, your young sons out to witness it. So what, 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 are, what, are, what, are these, what are these young boys taking with them as they move forward in, in life? The, these boys right here would be probably perhaps the same age or a little older than my own father. Uh, so I'm trying to make you feel how how not that far away this was. This, this isn't ancient history by any means. This still touches my life. This was happening. These young boys are the, is the generation that, that had, had mine, okay? Not that far back at all. So it's, it's an interesting idea. Vigilante justice, taking the law into your own hands, and it's mob rule, okay? Okay, back to women. We, we talked about how the Women's movement split after the uh, 15th Amendment. But in this era, they come back together, 1890. And the NAWSA was formed, and they reunite the formerly split movement. And women start to push for what's called feminism, pushing for women's full political, economic, and social equality. Uh, this, of course, would fuel the women's movements of the 60s and 70s. Uh, it would fade away in the 1980s as the religious right took hold and put women back in their in their homemakers role. This is also the era of science versus faith, and this continues to 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 be a raging argument. Do you believe in creation or do you believe in evolution? And this is not a a an argument that 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 is very light, and people get very angry about this. And it it really comes from this idea. Uh, from Charles Darwin, science versus faith is great debate, and Darwin starts it all. So, uh, you know, science began to be seen as an alternative belief to religion and the doctrine of creation. Uh, and you have the theory of evolution versus creation. So, of course, religious leaders stand up and 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 start to protest this and and speak out, and a movement starts against this. So, Darwin is the one that starts it, and he. And he writes this book called, called On the Origin of Species, um, where this idea is born of the survival of the fittest. And that, you know, uh, uh, animals that survive uh, will continue. The animals that don't won't. You evolve. Um, this, is, this is the idea of, of evolution. But, but people took his theories. So Darwin's theories was about the animal kingdom, not, not humans. But people took it and manipulated it and changed it into justifying racism and justifying exclusion, okay, and 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 getting rid of undesirable people that didn't fit in, uh, and it turned into what was called social Darwinism. So social Darwin, Darwin, 
Darwinism is a negative term that is taking Darwin's theories and and turning it into a human theory that that some people are better than others, some are stronger and smarter than others. And we've we've already learned in this class that that humans are all the same, one species, no subspecies. But yet they're trying to sell this idea that they're superior people and inferior people. It's not true. It's 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 a it's a lie. And it's not based on fact, but that's what they do, okay? Uh, they believe that some people were not fit to compete and stay relevant in the capitalist society that was built on fierce competition, okay? And this idea grows, and it became very, very popular. And social Darwinism became a movement called eugenics, okay? Uh, war on the weak Eugenics in America is, is a film that we're going to watch here. This is probably one of the more unsettling films. This is this is one that I get a lot of comments about. Uh, this is something that you'll probably not entirely believe that you, you'll you, you probably never heard of this. But as you'll see, this was a very popular movement, and it wasn't in, you know undercover secret. The government condoned it. Okay, eugenics. So eugenics is the idea of of Breeding out undesirables, okay, by by sterilizing um, women so they could not reproduce. Please watch the film War on the Weak, Eugenics in America, and then come on back. So, pretty frightening to believe that that was happening in 20th century America, not, not 17th or 18th, 20th century America. When my parents were young, this was happening, okay, so again, not that far back. And it's hard to imagine that in a country of, of freedom and equality, you know, again, you don't have to be, you know, uh, spectacular to be uh, uh, an American citizen. You don't have to be wealthy or smart. There, there's no bar. Whoever you are, you're a citizen. There, there is no, you know, uh, categories. But yet people want to do that. And this idea of breeding out undesirables people that have, you know, mental deficiencies, handicaps, if we don't allow them to reproduce, we'll create a master race. And of course, the film mentions that it inspired Hitler. So, of course, United States history and, and Americans in general, we're, we're going to criticize Hitler nonstop for his extermination of Jews, right? And his, and his, his, his racial hate. But yet, Dig deeper, you, you you can you find out that in fact Hitler was inspired by the American eugenics movement in our very own country. Okay. Okay, moving on. Um, I mentioned John Scopes before, the, the the man that I use as an example to show you. Besides Plessy and Rosa Parks, a, a man that chose to be arrested to try to get uh, the you know uh, the uh, in this case the idea of teaching evolution in the court. So. This is a 1925 case called the Scopes Monkey Trial, of course, because, you know, evolution claims that, that humans evolved from apes, okay? And that was a way to criticize it. They call it the Monkey Trial and speak not, hear not, see not. It just, it's just making fun of the idea. So John Scopes was arrested for teaching evolution. It was against the law to teach it, but he, again, he did it on purpose to set a precedent. He agreed to be arrested to force the issue. Again, he, he felt very sure that the Supreme Court would rule for him because of the, you know, the, the uh, citizenship rights. And, and that, of course, you're, you're teaching truth that's out there. You're not condoning it as your point of view, but there's, there's creation and there's evolution. That's like we do today. We have that choice today, and we teach both sides. They didn't want you to teach both sides in those days, and, and Scopes spoke up about it, okay? So the state of Tennessee versus John Thomas Scopes became the very famous science versus faith case, a hugely popular case. Uh, two very famous attorneys, um, William Jennings Bryan on the right, old school pro-religion uh, attorney versus Clarence Darrow, more of the, on the left, a more modern science uh, uh, secular man, okay? So Scopes actually lost the trial, and it, 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 they went against him, and he was fined, although the verdict was overturned on a technicality. Okay, so all, all these things are happening. You know, I mean, uh, the United States is kind of 
Austin loose here as the 20th century begins. It's completely changing. You know, what, what they were 50 years before was completely different than what they are in this era. And and people start to view things differently. And they start to see things that, that, that life isn't always so pretty. In fact, most people have it pretty bad. And you have a, you have a, the, the stage is kind of set for a quest for what's called realism, okay? So, so what is that? Realism is is somewhat of a of a you know a, a movement in art and literature, and it replaced 19th century romanticism. So romanticism was all about the idealized world. Everybody's perfect. Everyone's you know um, beautiful, and, and uh, there's always a happy ending. But that's not real life because the vast majority of people in the United States look like this, working hard, have, having no future, no no, uh, you know, no hope for the future. So realism, uh, the idea that there is not always a happy ending and life is not always so pretty. So, so realism is, is about no embellishments, no exaggerations. You're trying to overturn sentimentalism and you turn towards naturalism. And that's the definition from the book, to picture a daily life in the most exact term possible overturn sentimentalism and a return to naturalism. Okay? Uh, so this is just being more realistic about what life, what life really was like. Uh, Samuel Clements, I'm sorry, uh, I, I missed my, my quote here. Human beings were not so much rational agents and shapers of their own destiny as blind victims of forces beyond their control. A working class person that has no, no future, no hope, they don't really have, they can't shape their own destiny. They're, they they are victims of forces that they can't do anything about. That's real. That's not romantic. That's real. Okay. Samuel Clements, Mark Twain, uh, he held a very bleak view of society. So though he wrote beloved books about Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, American classics, his books had anti-slavery topics. He criticized progress. He rejected the Christian faith. This is a this move towards modernism to overturn convention, overturn tradition, and focus on the primitive mind about who we really really are deep down inside, with with all the accoutrements of society taken away from us. Uh, so these types of belief systems began to emerge as America had more time to ponder. Again, this is still a new concept, more leisure time. You have a life outside of just working. So intellectual pursuits became popular. And many of these pursuits started with common people. It's not always a, a perceived leader or somebody wealthy. The average person began to see that they could make headway in the world themselves. Uh, and it, it, be it became somewhat of an attack on traditional religion, okay? Uh, Science began to intrude on the doctrines of religion, and many people started to question their faith. But religion remains strong in America, and it stays strong today. It's a huge part of, of, the, of the foundation of who the American people are. America was built on freedom of religion, separation of church and state, to not create a system that had been the model in Europe with the state religion that in many cases resulted in many deaths if you did not believe in that religion. Uh, we talked about push-pull factors. Religious persecution was one of those. Persecution pushed people away, pushed them towards America. Get out of Europe and go to America to, for, for, to, to get away from that. But it brought many different types of people, uh, mostly white people, but now it's not just Protestants. You've got Catholics, you got, you got Jewish people entering a Protestant-based society, okay? So when the country began, it was mostly white Protestants. The, the, the blacks were enslaved, the, the natives were on reservations. So for, for a while, it was a white Protestant country. But then immigration starts because the factory starts and the, and the job opportunities and the, and the coming to America to, to find your fortune. And people come, but they weren't all white Protestants anymore. They're Catholic. They, they, were, they were Irish. They were Jewish. And all these people were frightening to the white Protestants. Uh, so in a country that promoted freedom of religion, it didn't always work. There was still discrimination against certain religions. 
If you attempt to bend your religion to the spirit of your surroundings, it breaks, it falls to pieces. So organizations began to, to fight back against these, these different people coming into America with their different religions and their different languages and their different customs. The American Protective Agency, founded in 1887, founded by, by Protestants, very, very militant and anti-Catholic, also anti-immigration. And the image that you see here, it looks like alligators coming out of the sea. So they're on the coast. These alligators are coming from Europe. But if you look closely at the alligators, they, they look like the Pope in the dress that the Pope would wear. So it's, 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 it's Catholics attacking America. Okay. <clears throat> this led to the, the movement of nativism. <clears throat> Welcome to the USA. Stay away. Uh, Native Americans, beware of foreign influence. <clears throat> so a nativist group would promote Protestant values and ban Catholicism. So remember, ethnocentrism. Our way is the best way, or, or there's no way, um, in a country that advocated free, freedom of religion. So Protestants found their position in majority and dominance was challenged by the influx of immigrants Again, primarily Catholics and Jews, and this idea of nativism became popular. What is it? The policy of protecting the interests of native-born or established inhabitants against those of immigrants. <clears throat> so of course, the question's pretty obvious. Uh, are white Protestants native-born to the United States? Well, no, they're not. The only people that are native-born would be people of Mexican, Hispanic, or indigenous descent. Uh, if you're a white person, you are not a native to this land. You, you came here, and, and you have become an established inhabitant, but you are not native born. And this is an interesting cartoon. So here's a, here's a man, that, a typical white businessman. Uh, it's time to reclaim America from illegal immigrants. He's pointing at an illegal uh, you know, family from Mexico. Uh, of course, the Native American says, I'll help you back. You know, I'm the only Native around here. What are you talking about? You came here too. You, you, weren't, you weren't born here. So nativism became, becomes very popular. And this goes back to the 1840s and 50s, but it comes back to life at, at the turn of the 20th century. The Ku Klux Klan comes back to life. You know, America's about bitterness and hate very, very much. It's a, it's a huge part of our history. <clears throat> Uh, if you ever saw the movie Gangs of New York, that movie's all about nativism. Okay, they actually had their own political party. That, that's how strong the, the movement was, and the party was called the Know Nothing Party in the 1840s and 50s. Uh, Protestant-based party vehemently opposed Catholicism. Uh, they didn't like uh, the idea of revering a pope. That was the middleman between you and God, and they didn't believe that. But they also figured that if the, if the Catholic immigrants took over, they'd install the Pope as the president. And Protestants were fearful of that. They feared competition for jobs. So the Know Nothing Party was a secret organization uh, that who, if questioned, if, if you question somebody, what is your political affiliation? And they said, I know nothing. That meant that they were a member of the No Nothing Party, okay? Donald Trump today is criticized for being a nativist and, and a return to nativism. Is, is America becoming reactionary and paranoid and isolationist again under Donald Trump? So all, all these things are happening. And of course, in response to it, the religious leaders stand up to to deal with it, okay? And you, and you have, have the the return of evangelism, Protestants turn to evangelism and the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness and the social gospel. So what, what is the social gospel? The idea of renewing religious faith through de dedication to justice and social welfare. Excuse me. So, for example, the Salvation Army was begun to assist the urban poor and people in poverty even today. The, social, the Salvation Army's message is based on a social gospel message. So you have to return to fundamentalism as a way to deal with all these conflicts. 
So fundamentalism rejected realism, rejected modernism. They didn't. They don't like that. They, they promoted the literal truth of the Bible. Secularism was sinful, and they were orthodox in their beliefs. What is orthodox? Conforming to the Christian faith as represented in the creeds of the early church. So going back to the very, very beginning, perhaps even the Old Testament, going back that far and promoting those values. And that goes back a long, long way. And bringing that forward to today in a modern world is, is difficult. But that's what orthodox means, going, going back to the, the very beginning. Okay. And and they use they use revival meetings to, to spread the word, uh, and uh, these revivals that, that you saw in this first and second great awakening in the 18th 19th centuries kind of starts again in the 20th, and you have a return to to evangelism. Okay, that is the end of chapter 18. Thank you.